Ray walked along the avenue at a brisk pace and thought regretfully that there were no parking closer to the notary's office than here. He glanced along the lively street fair, spontaneously placed along the small square, and did not immediately realise what had caught his attention. When he came closer, he noticed a little girl, about twelve years old, selling some trinkets and beadwork. It did not seem surprising. A lot of kids do part-time work nowadays, washing cars, handing out flyers, but something stung Ray from the inside. He did not notice how he was beside her and took one of her bracelets with a rose. At that time, Ray's throat tightened and the memories that he had driven away from him for a year came crashing down on him with terrible force. His six-year-old daughter, Nicole, had also tried to weave such bracelets, but now she was gone. Almost a year ago, she was killed under the wheels of a car. Ray blamed himself for his daughter's death because if he had not been distracted then, just for a minute on a phone call, the girl would have remained alive. One moment was enough for the child to run out of the playground fence on the road for the ball and was hit by a car. That day, it seemed to Ray and his wife, Dorothy, that their lives were over because there is no grief worse than the death of their own child. But the worst was ahead because they had to live on to eat, to drink, to breathe, understanding that all this is meaningless. And even trying not to think and remember that nightmare, there was always something that revived those terrible memories, like this bracelet for the moment. To distract himself, Ray asked the girl if she made all these bracelets herself. She nodded affirmatively and looked up at Ray. Stunned, he stared into those eyes, rare emerald shade, and he remembered again his little dead daughter. She had the same eyes as indeed he had. And the little girl looked subtly like Nicole, only older. While he was thinking of all these coincidences, the girl began to show him what other items of adornment she had, told him that she often sold hair, and could even make something custom-made. Ray looked at the girl and noted to himself that she was obviously from a poor family, dressed rather poorly, and suddenly to himself he asked, "'How much is all this worth?' I want to buy it all. The girl told Ray the price, and he pulled out his wallet and paid. Of course, he didn't want the ornaments, he just wanted to help this girl, who reminded him so much of his daughter. Ray wondered what she was spending the proceeds on, and her answer shocked the man. New beads, some groceries, bread, milk, sometimes I make good money like today the girl replied with a smile. Today we have enough for meat. We'll make soup with Mom. Ray didn't understand what kind of parents it was that couldn't give a child what she needed. He thought that he would never allow this to happen to his daughter. He was well aware of poverty himself and had done everything to ensure that his family did not need anything. But he had the money now, but he no longer had his daughter. After taking the purchases, Ray wandered towards the parked car. Once he had calmed down, he continued on his way, but his thoughts kept returning to that girl. It was not pity for the unfortunate child. It was a strange, inexplicable feeling that made him think of her again and again. Perhaps he just saw her as his Nicole, as she would never be any more. At home in the evening, he could not keep his thoughts to himself and shared them with his wife. Dorothy, I don't understand what is happening to me. Today, I met a girl on the street who looked a lot like our Nicole. I'm sure she is exactly what our daughter would look like in a few years, Ray muttered and immediately realised from his wife's face that he had caused her great pain. 
Do you want to break my heart completely? Almost cried out his wife. No, of course not. I'm just shocked. And it seemed so strange to me. Ray muttered and told his wife all the details of that meeting and even showed her the beadwork he had bought. Dorothy cried even harder and her husband calmed her down for a long time but still asked to go with him tomorrow to see the girl and maybe even bring her some gifts and food. Dorothy did not understand why Ray needed all this, but she did not argue and finally agreed. When the couple arrived at the market the next day, the girl was not there. The man found out from one of the local saleswomen that her name was Sophia. She was 11 years old and she lived with her sick mother. As it turned out, the girl had not only to do all the housework, but also to work to earn money for food, because all of her mother's disability pension is spent on drugs. In addition, the chatty woman said that Sophia had never seen her father, and that her mother, Angela, had never been married. On the pretext that they wanted to make a large order, Ray and Dorothy found out from a good-natured woman the address of Sophia and having bought warm knitted socks from her as a thank you for the information, they went to visit the girl. On the way, they stopped at a supermarket and bought the necessary groceries. The door was opened by Sophia. Ray greeted her and reminded her that he had bought all the bracelets yesterday and that he had come with his wife to place a new order, since they liked what she did very much. Dorothy smiled warmly and asked the girl to show her other works. The girl was flattered and surprised, but at the same time could not hide her joy. I'll show all. It's in my room. But I'll warn my mother now. She's lying over there. The girl went into the next room, and Dorothy looked at her husband in amazement. Ray, she doesn't look like Anne Nicole. She looks like you. How can that be? She didn't have time to make her assumptions because Sophia called them into her mother's room. Behind a small screen lay a still, young but very pale woman. She looked out from behind the screen, glanced at the man and could not look away. Ray, you found us, she exclaimed. Angela stared at her in amazement. Ray, who understood everything at once. Dorothy Sophia, can you sit in the kitchen for now? Angela and I need to talk. Sophia was surprised, but Dorothy understood everything too. Hugging the girl by the shoulders, she quietly led her out of the room. Ray sat down on a chair beside the bed, and his mind instantly flashed through all the events of those distant days that had parted him once with this woman. He and Angela had gone to college together, had loved each other, and were getting married. Angela was the most charming girl in the class, and many tried to woo her, even his friend Zane. But she chose Ray out of all of them. And at that moment, though Zane stepped aside, he held a grudge and tried in every way to smear Angela in the eyes of his friend. Zane constantly told Ray that he had decided to get married early and often hinted at Angela's undignified behaviour. Ray never took his friend's angry words to heart. He understood that it was because of his resentment that he said so, and therefore he never got angry. Ray was getting ready for the wedding. He had already bought the rings and was going to set a wedding day, but it all turned out differently. On his way to his beloved's house, with a ring and a bouquet, he stopped by his friend's house at his request. When Zane, half-naked and dishevelled, opened the door, Ray saw Angela asleep on his couch. He jumped up to the girl and began shaking her roughly. That's how you love me, huh? I hate you! Zane, you can keep her. I don't need her any more. Ray shouted in impotent rage. Ray, what's going on? Incoherently mumbled Angela. He decided that she was drunk as well and squirming with disgust, jumped out of the apartment. 
And then, everything was like a fog. First he got drunk in a doubtful company, then he barely made it home. Angela tried many times to talk to him and explain everything, but he did not want to listen. Then he transferred to another college and left. He worked, built his career, and couldn't date anyone for a long time due to mistrust, until he met Dorothy. The old love seemed distant and unreal to him, and was forgotten. And now he met her again, and in such strange circumstances. He had no anger or resentment against Angela, only a pang of pity, and he was now tormented by only one question. Angela, I'm sorry, but I'm here accidentally. Sophia is my daughter, isn't she? Don't you see? She looks just like you. I was just about to tell you about the pregnancy, but it came out like this. I don't know how Zane set it up. But Ray didn't want to hear the explanations again, because there was no point in them now. But Angela insisted. Wait, I don't want you to think badly of me. After all, I will soon be gone from this world. But that's not what I mean. I didn't cheat on you. Zane called me to his house. He said you were coming. Then he gave me some tea with some sleeping pills. When you came, I just woke up. I felt so bad. I tried to explain everything to you, but you didn't give me a chance. And then I took offence myself, decided I'd live alone with the baby. And I would have, if it hadn't been for my illness. Ray looked at his former lover and could not believe that life had treated them so unfairly and cruelly. He asked Angela how he could help her and realised that Angela's illness was incurable and there was nothing that could help. He also told her about his grief, about his daughter he had lost not so long ago. Angela sincerely sympathised with Ray because the loss of a child was the worst thing in the world. And she herself now worried only one thing. What would happen to Sophia? Because if she died, the girl would be sent to an orphanage. Ray, I beg you, when I die, don't leave Sophia. Take her to yourself. You see, she is your daughter. She won't give you any trouble. She is clever and knows how to do everything by herself. Let me die in peace, knowing that my girl is in good hands. What on earth are you talking about? Of course Sophia will live with us. And your wife? Will she agree? I think she's very nice. Call her. I want to talk to her. Ray stood up, kissed Angela on the cold cheek and went out. He asked Dorothy to come in to see Angela and he himself sat down on the stool and looked intently at his daughter. Sophia, you know, it just so happens that I'm your father. Wow! And my mother told me that you would come some day and we would all be together. How's that going to work out now? What about your wife? She's so good. It's complicated, honey, but I promise we'll all be together for sure. Ray understood that the girl knew that her mother would soon be gone, but there was such hope glowing in her huge green eyes that he couldn't say anything. Soon, Dorothy came out of the room, and from her face, Ray realised that the conversation was not easy for her. Ray and Dorothy said a warm goodbye to Sophia, and promised to come back again. In the car, Dorothy could not stand it, and she burst into bitter tears. She wept with pity and pain for this little girl, whose mother was dying, and no one could do anything. She felt pity for Angela, who was so tormented by her illness that she dreamed of death, and only worrying about her daughter gave her some strength to live. She sobbed and swore that she would do anything for this little girl, anything she could not do for her dead daughter. She reproached Ray for living for so many years without knowing anything about his child. Her husband tried to reassure her, but he himself was thinking. 
he was tormented by memories. After Nicole's birth, the doctors told Dorothy that she was unable to have any more children. And after the tragedy, when he hinted at the possibility of adoption, Dorothy flatly refused. She believed then that no one would be able to replace Nicole, and it would be difficult for her to love someone else's child. And so now, Ray was overcome with doubts. Now Dorothy was emotional, ready to do anything for Sophia's sake. And then what? After all, Sophia was his own daughter. But would Dorothy be able to accept her as her own? At home, the woman sensed what her husband was thinking. Do you think I can't be a good mother to your daughter? Ray wanted to object, but his wife stopped him. I'm not going to become her mother. She has one mother, and she doesn't need another. She's old enough to love a stranger as her own mother. Ray was shocked. He had the horrible thought that Dorothy didn't want them to take Sophia in, and just didn't know what he should do now. He wasn't ready to break up with Dorothy, but he wasn't going to give up his daughter either. He was about to fall into despair, but Dorothy explained everything. She said that there were many other forms of relationship, and she was ready for them. If Sophia wouldn't accept her as a mother, then Dorothy could be just her friend, which wasn't so bad. So Dorothy was determined that they should do everything for Angela and Sophia. Help them until the woman died and then take Sophia in. She was prepared for the fact that they might have to wait a long time for Sophia to accept them as relatives, and maybe that would never happen. Ray agreed with his wife on many things and was once again convinced that he had not made a mistake in choosing her as his life partner. No matter what happened, he would accept any decision Sophia made, because in essence, he was to blame before her. He was the one who left her mother pregnant, and so they survived as best they could. Maybe the whole situation caused the disease too. Equally hard and complicated was the conversation between Sophia and her mother that same evening. The girl sat on the edge of the bed, took her mother's hand, and began to ask her about her father. Most of all, she wanted to know how they would live together now that her father was married. Her mother looked seriously at Sophia. Daughter, I am thrilled that your father has been found, but I don't need him any more. Now I can die in peace, knowing that you will not be sent to an orphanage, and you can live in a good family with your own father and his wife. She's a very good and kind woman. Will she be my mother? But I only want you. Baby, that's impossible. But you should remember that mothers never die. They stay forever in the hearts of their children. I will always be with you in your heart. And with Dorothy, you can become good friends. She will certainly understand you. She herself lost her daughter and knows what the loss of a loved one is and will not demand the impossible from you. Then Angela told her sobbing daughter how an evil man had cruelly separated her and Sophia's father, and neither she nor he was to blame for what had happened. It was fate. It happened. But now she was sure that Sophia would still be happy. And if you want to call Dorothy mum, I won't be offended. That way you'll be closer to each other if you call her as your mother. Mum, I will never love Dorothy the way I love you. Only you are my mother. Realising that it was getting late and the mother was probably tired of all this talk, Sophia brought her pills and put her to bed. She sat by her mother's bedside and thought that she would definitely become a doctor when she grew up and treat the most severe diseases so that at least some children 
would not be deprived of their mothers so early. So, in two houses, there were essentially the same conversation, which clarified a lot for all the participants in this sad story. The next day, Ray went about arranging paternity. It was not difficult because no one challenged it, and then the days, painful for everyone, stretched on. Ray and Dorothy often came to visit. Dorothy talked to Angela about many things, trying to find out everything about Sophia, down to the smallest detail. Seeing how Dorothy was preparing herself responsibly for her future role, Angela calmed down. Sophia, too, slowly got used to her new relatives. They often went for walks with her father, talked, and the girl increasingly thought that a good life awaited her, only without her mother. Thoughts of her mother's imminent death kept her awake and terrified. Six months later, it finally happened. Realising that the woman's condition was very bad, Dorothy often stayed the night at Angela's and Sophia's house. And then one day, waking up, Dorothy realised that Angela was gone. The woman had gone quietly in her bed, with a peaceful smile on her exhausted face. Sophia woke up and cried at her mother's bedside for a long time, until she was taken away. Afterwards, Dorothy took the girl to her and Ray's house. After Angela's funeral, she officially became Ray and Dorothy's daughter, but she did not call her mother, though she became very attached to her. She sometimes asked if Dorothy was not offended that she called her by her first name, and the woman always reassured the girl, saying that she understood everything and was happy that they simply had a good relationship. And the relationship was so wonderful that strangers had no idea that Dorothy was not Sophia's birth mother. And then one day, when several years had passed, Dorothy still heard from her stepdaughter, the long-awaited mum. On the Mother's Day, you know, I've always called you mother in front of friends and teachers, but to the eyes never dared. So today, I would like to thank you for all your love. I love you, Mom. My girl, Dorothy hugged Sophia impetuously. From the first meeting, I loved you as my own. We will always remember your mother, but that won't stop us from loving each other. And so lived this full and happy family, united not only by love and respect for each other, but also by the memory of those who had gone forever. <laughs>